Good morning. Pastor Peter Chen will today share the message from the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. I'll read in Spanish, and Delia will read in English. Hear the word of the Lord. Acuérdate del sábado para consagrarlo. Trabaja seis días y haz en ellos todo lo que tengas que hacer. Pero el día séptimo será un día de reposo para honrar al Señor tu Dios. No hagas en ese día ningún trabajo, ni tampoco tu hijo, ni tu hija, ni tu esclavo, ni tu esclava, ni tus animales, ni tampoco los, los extranjeros que vivan en tus ciudades. Acuérdate de que en seis días hizo el Señor los cielos y la tierra, el mar y todo lo que hay en ellos, y que descansó el séptimo día. Por eso el Señor bendijo y consagró el día de reposo. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, before I started, want to say thank you to the board and to Kim. Uh, Kim, your pun game is quite strong with the whole rack family <laughs> thing going on. Uh, appreciate all the appreciation. Did want to echo that just for our staff. I think our staff has done a tremendous job adjusting to a very tumultuous year. And I think one turning moment for us was right when we shut down our in-person services, we gathered together in the map room and were trying to re-strategize. And what we realized was that um, many of the ways in which we were doing church, many of the tools that we had were taken away from us, our in-person service and the building and many of those things. But the goals hadn't changed at all. That the goal of glorifying God, bringing people closer to the love of Jesus, announcing and living out the kingdom, none of those things had changed. All the tools changed, sure, but ultimately the center of what we were doing as a church remained fixed. And I think that really helped to guide our actions throughout this year, is that the, the rules had changed, but the goal ultimately had not. And I think that's helpful not just for the staff, but really for all of us, whether you're in a family or you're at home or at work, whatever the case might be. Our callings have not changed at all, although the ways that we live have. And I thought that was really sent and really empowering for us and really helpful. But a huge thank you to the staff for not losing sight of the goal of what we do as a church, even as we change everything of how we do it. Um, as you know, this is the last Sunday of 2020. We are finally getting through this year. And one tradition that we often do at the beginning of the year is we engage in prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting is this great discipline that carves out time and space in our lives so that we can really focus on God. And this year, the focus that we're going to have in the month of January as we pray and fast is to recenter ourselves. It has been such a chaotic and strange year, and we desperately need that sense of just going deep and, and anchoring ourselves in the Lord again. And so that's kind of going to be the focus of our time throughout January. So we encourage you to think about one thing, one practice, one thing to fast from in order to make more time for God in your life. Um, and as we do that, we have an intercessory prayer team who will be kind of guiding us. So this, this team has created a guide, which we will put out there uh, sometime this week, so that you can print it out and just have something to pray through every week. And we also will have an online prayer meeting where you can join um, and just be in prayer with other people and receive prayer as well. And so this would be a good way to kind of give structure to our time of prayer and to fasting. And that will start next Sunday, January 4th, and end on Sunday, January the 31st, which is actually the, the Sunday of the annual meeting as well, just to give you a heads up of what's coming. And so, again, a great way, I think, to start this year off right, centered on the Lord, uh, kind of focused on Him. And I did want to give a shout out to this team who is kind of guiding us through uh, this prayer and fasting time. Uh, this prayer team is Keith Igarashi, Roselle Collins, Robin Kane, Judy Nebel. 
Uh, if you know those four, you know the decades of Christian maturity and practice that they represent. As pastors, as leaders, as board members, as missionaries, they, uh, they have been Christians longer than many of us have been alive and been walking with the Lord in that way. And so I'm really looking forward to submitting to their wisdom. They're often asking me, like, Pastor, what do you want to do? What's your vision? And I'm, I'm kind of like, I, I think I should ask you guys. You guys have done this for a lot longer than I have. And so I'm really looking forward to just kind of recentering myself through their leadership as well. And I encourage you to do the same. Uh, with that, uh, this is this time of the year where we're really thinking about the new year, about 2021 and what's to come. Uh, the last week of December, the first week of January, we are hyper-focused on that as a nation. We're thinking about resolutions. We're thinking about plans. It's definitely a time to look forward to what is to come. Um, where are we going to travel? What classes are we going to take? The new year definitely is focused on that attitude of, of looking forward. And so that, throughout this season, will definitely be conversations that we're having, the attitude that we have. That's our focus during this time. And, you know, rightly so, that January and the New Year should have that kind of focus about thinking about what is to come. What's interesting to me, though, is that ultimately, as Americans, we do this all the time. That American culture and the American ethos, it's always about what's coming next, what's in front of us, right? Very rarely looking back, but always thinking about the next thing and, and expanding out to something new. And that's been a part of the national character for a long time. And I think it's captured so well in this painting that sits in the House of Representatives called Westward, the Course of Empire Takes Its Way. And I don't think Emanuel Lutz of thought is ironic, but it kind of feels a lot ironic now. But it's this captures a sense of manifest destiny, this destiny placed upon the American people to spread all throughout this continent. And if we could show that uh, picture one more time, that painting one more time, you can see that there's a contrast between the dark past, right, and the right of that painting, the past, or the East Coast, really, is dark, it's gray, and everyone's looking forward to this bright thing. They're striding confidently into the future. This captures kind of the American culture of always pressing forward, of always thinking, what's next? What are we doing next? What's the next big thing to come? We feel that when it comes to TV or to movies, even to church, I often will hear after a big event, so what's coming next? And so this is just part of our character as Americans is that we do the New Year's thing all the time. Our culture, believe it or not, is progressive in that way. We're always thinking about what is coming, always pressing into the next big thing. What's really interesting, though, as we kind of just understand that is how different that was from the culture of the people of Israel. Because we look at the, the rhythms and the festivals of the people of Israel, we don't find so much of people who were looking at the next best thing that is to come, but instead, so many elements of their life was actually devoted to looking backwards and understanding their past instead. And today's passage from Exodus chapter 20 is a great example of that because it talks about the Sabbath. And the Sabbath often we see as the command that we are to fulfill, and we kind of see it in that very narrow light. I'm supposed to do this thing. And it begins that way when it says this in verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall do no work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. So right there, we often see that just as something that we're supposed to do, this commandment that we are supposed to fulfill, and that's kind of the end, that we see it as one of the Ten Commandments. But it goes on to explain the reasoning behind the Sabbath in this. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. And so here we get a deeper sense of what this command is about. This command is not simply something they are to do. It is something they do to remember what God has done. It's a practice of remembrance. It's not just not working. It's a moment for them to remember that everything that they see around them, the vastness of creation was created by God. 
And yet even God in his majesty and his power rested from that labor. And so that rest should permeate all of creation. That all things should rest in the same way that God rested. This commandment was a commandment to remember. To remember what God had done. Every single week. That one day out of the week they would take to simply remember what God had done. That's how focused their their life was on remembering. And this is just one small part of how their life uh, focused on looking back and knowing their story. You have the story of Passover, where they are remembering their liberation from Egyptian slavery. You have the festival of Hanukkah, the festival of lights, which takes place uh, during this time. We remember the rededication of the temple. They had been occupied by the Seleucids, and finally uh, the, the temple had been desecrated, and they rededicated it to the Lord after that. You have Purim, where they are in exile uh, with the Persians. And Queen Esther actually stands up and saves the people of Israel from Haman's plot of genocide. You have Shavuot, which takes place during the Pentecost season, where they remember how God gave the law to Moses from Mount Sinai. So it's not just once a week, but over and over throughout the year, they are constantly looking back, constantly looking back at what God had done and the different moments of their own story and their own life. And so it's very different from our context where we are constantly pressing forward, trying not to look back at our dirty, dingy past and pressing it to the next thing. People of Israel were constantly thinking about the past instead and remembering what had happened. And that can throw us off again because of our culture, again, is so forward-thinking, so much about the next best thing. But I think a passage of Deuteronomy really helps to capture the blessings of this and why the people of Israel were commanded to remember so often throughout their lives. And this is what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 8, and this describes some of the blessings of this practice of remembrance. Be careful to follow every command I am giving you today that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothes did not wear out, and your feet did not swell during these 40 years. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord God disciplines you. When you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I am giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied... When you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud, and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. He led you through the vast and dreadful wilderness, that thirsty and waterless land with its venomous snakes and scorpions. He brought you water out of hard rock. He gave you manna to eat in the wilderness, something your ancestors had never known, to humble and test you so that in the end it might go well with you. You may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember, the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. So what I love about this passage is I think that it, it helps to teach us the forward-looking, what-comes-next people, the incredible blessings of looking back and remembering. One of the blessings is this, is that we can know ourselves better by not forgetting our own stories. I don't know if it's just me and my advancing age, but I often can't remember what I've done in a given week. I can't remember like what I ate last night or the night before. And it gets much worse than that. Sometimes I forget huge things that have ever happened. I will go through my journal and I'll reread it and I'll think, I forgot that ever happened at all. And I, don't, I think many of us kind of feel that way with everything that's going on in the news and the anxiety. Many of our stories can slip out of our mind. And so remembering helps us to keep hold of our stories. But an important thing is this is that your story 
is who you are. That what you experience and the people that you meet and all your situations that you encounter essentially is yourself. That's who you are. If you know your stories, you know yourself. And conversely, if we can't even remember where we've been, you can't remember, we can't remember who we've met, we can't remember the good and the bad, how can we really say we know ourselves? How can we understand our ambitions or our motivations or our strengths and our weaknesses if we don't remember what we've been through? And so this is one huge component of why we need to remember so that we can remember our stories so that we can remember who we are, so we can know ourselves better. The people of Israel, as they remember all of their journeys and their stories, they are seeing themselves. It's a personality test. That's what God reveals in Deuteronomy 8. These things happen so that you would know what's in your heart, that you would know yourself and how much you need the Lord. So it is ourselves. If we don't know our stories, we don't know ourselves. That's why we take time to remember. Another reason why we remember is that we can recognize the presence and work of God in the midst of those stories. So yes, we will begin to better remember our stories and know ourselves, yes. But as we recognize those stories, what we then can do is we can begin to discern God's hand in those stories. Begin to see this is not just my story, it's God's story. That's what we read in Deuteronomy 8. This is not just the people of Israel wandering and the people of Israel going. It's God liberating them. It's God giving them manna. It's God giving them water of the, out of the rock. It's God giving them a new home. This is God's story, not just their story. And so it is with us that as we begin to know our story, we begin to see how God has shaped it. We begin to discern where God has been and what God has done. That is no longer my story. It's God's story. It's a story he has orchestrated. He has written, yes, on my behalf, for me, with me, but still very much involving God. Another crucial reason why we remember so that we can see God and recognize him fully throughout our lives. The third blessing of remembrance is this. We can have better bearings for the future. That as we begin to know our stories, know ourselves, know how God has been present in them, we will then have a better way of living in the future. That's what we find in Deuteronomy 8. He says, do this so that when you go into the new land, you will live and you will increase. Do this so that in the future, when you are uh, more established, when your need, your basic needs are fulfilled, you will never forget that it wasn't you. And you'll never put your trust in sinking sand. It's just going to fade away. But instead, you'll remember that it all came from the Lord. This is not just for the past. It's not just for navel-gazing and looking back upon our lives to our glory days. This is to prepare us for the future so that we will live differently. We'll have different guideposts throughout our lives, different bearings to live in a different way so that the next year might be different from the year that preceded it. So we see that there are so many blessings, and, and that is why even though culturally, subconsciously, we are so forward-looking and we are so devoted to what's the next big thing, what's the thing that we're doing next, so how are we expanding out in some way, we need to take moments where we simply remember Because if we move too quickly on to thinking about where we go next, we miss out on the important benefits of remembering where we have been. We will miss out on knowing ourselves. We will miss out on recognizing that God has been working and active all throughout every moment of our lives. And we will miss out on the opportunity to change course, to shift so that we might live. To shift that we might trust God instead of our material possessions and our wealth and whatever else that we do. We will miss out on those blessings if we simply charge forward without taking time to remember. I want us to take this seriously, and part of that is that I want us to actually do that today. I don't think a discussion time today is going to capture it all, but I wanted to begin that moment today by having us actually Um, have some discussion that comes out of what I just talked about. So what we're going to do is I'm going to invite Pastor Mark and Heather up here to join me, and we're going to have, we're going to just talk about uh, some questions, and you at home, just kind of imagine yourself virtually with us. You're kind of with us during this time. You can be on the live chat. We'll be looking at it and kind of reading your responses, 
And uh, you can do that. Or if you're with people at home, I encourage you, just mute us. Just mute us and talk about these questions uh, amongst yourselves. They're very general. They're very brief. But I think what they're doing more than anything is just changing our attitude so that we might be thinking uh, about what has happened and not, about, uh, not just about what is to come. Um, so, Pastor Mark, Heather, I'm glad you guys could be here for this time. Let me mask up here in a second. So again, um, if you're at home, you are officially invited to this virtual time. Uh, you can answer the questions in a live chat, and we'll be happy to kind of read them out and interact with them. Or, again, if you want to just mute and talk about this with your family or friends, we encourage you to do that as well. Uh, but the first question that I want to give us some time to think about is, this past year, what has your story been? What has your story been? And what have you learned about yourself through this story? So if you remember, um, knowing our stories is knowing ourselves. And you can't, you, can't know, you can't say, oh, I know myself, but I forgot where I was. I forgot where I've been. I forgot what I've done. And so um, that's the first question that we're asking everyone is what has been your story for this year and what do you know about yourself because of that? What have you learned about yourself? Pastor Mark, what, what, what comes to mind when you think about that? Yeah, you know, I really like this question because it actually takes me back to the sabbatical that I was on and I felt like one of the main questions that God was asking me to wrestle with is who is the real Mark, you know? And mm -hmm. as I was doing that, I remember I was at a silent retreat and I remember mentioning I was going for a silent retreat and Mariana was like, what, Mark can survive at a silent retreat? <laughs> yes, I did. Okay, I did survive. Um, I'll never forget that. But anyway, at this retreat, I, I, I started, as I was reflecting, I began to realize that uh, I, I felt like God was taking me back all the way to my childhood, like, right? Mm. Exactly what you're saying, remember who you are. And I realized that as a last born, um, I was, you know, um, I come from a very big family, but um, for a long time I was the last born. And as the last born, like, you don't say anything. Or, or, or whatever you say doesn't really count, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's not that people, they want to hear. But all it's the just, last borns are like, yeah. Oh like, because everyone else, you know, has something to say and no one is going to follow what the last one says and so for me it was literally just go with the flow it mm. doesn't matter how you feel mm. whether you like it or not mm. um, you just go with the flow because that's what everyone you know all the other people have said and so out of that I realized that I I learned not to pay attention to my feelings mm. or to my emotions because it, it, it just felt like they didn't count. It's whatever everyone else said. Mm. But when I was at this retreat and again, also during this time of COVID of just being allowed to slow down and pay attention, I realized that, that God was inviting me to start paying attention to my emotions and to my feelings because they matter. I felt mm. that that's what God was saying. Mm. Hey, let's sit down and I want you to share with me how you feel. Mm. So, yeah, that's one of the things that I learned about myself, that I need to learn to pay attention to my feelings and my emotions and where I am physically, spiritually, emotionally, because yeah. it matters. So yeah. that was a huge, huge lesson that wow. I learned. Yeah. I mean, that's huge to say you matter, right? If we yeah. learn that, that's, <laughs> that is so basic, but so, so last important. bones matter. Yeah, you know? yeah. yeah. <laughs> so Ken and James, you got to treat your brother differently. I think Tell them. Tell that's them. pretty clear. Heather, how about you? I mean, we, I think we've got some time here. So, like, what do you feel has been, like, your story for the year, and what have, what is, what has it kind of taught you? Yeah, I mean, I think kind of things that I thought I knew about myself or about kind of who I am or what I need, like, a lot of those layers got stripped away, it felt like, this year. Um, and I, yeah, I re resonate a lot with what the the Schneiders are sharing about just the vulnerability of this year of mm -hmm. like, um, I mean, I really like to go do things and be beautiful places. And it felt like with a lot of that being taken away, like before this year, if I couldn't have that, I would be really antsy and really like, no, this is who I am. This is what I need. Mm -hmm. And then having this year where it's like, no, you, you can't have that. You can't mm. do things. You can't be anywhere. You just need to be at home. And to say like, oh, that's also something that's healthy and that's good and that I, I need to lean into and I can lean into. So mm. I think kind of 
checking some of um, yeah some of the things that I thought I knew about myself and and really leaning into rest, kind of like back to the scripture that you were talking about of like God did create us to rest and to not like I think in the flurry of activity it's so easy to lean into activity and to not pay attention and to say like oh that's that is an important practice like I could I could cultivate that yeah and that's okay yeah yeah I think yeah yeah the the pandemic forced us to do things that we don't usually do yeah but then sometimes in that to realize oh I needed to do that nonetheless or that it's not as bad or there's a part of that 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 kind of feeds our soul still is uh, it was really shocking I think mm-hmm. sometimes yeah mm-hmm. um, again we encourage you if you if you'd like to we're happy we can see all the responses so if there's something that uh, you'd like to answer we'd love to kind of call that out the second question it comes very much out of what we talked about which is how has your story from this year been part of God's story for your life there is that transition right from saying oh I know myself and I know whatever to being able to attribute it to God, to say, no, this is God's story, yeah. right? And to, to, to take that step from merging those two, or actually one becoming dominant over the other ultimate, which is God's story. And I wonder for, for you, Heather, like what, where have you seen that? Where have you seen what looks like just your story yeah. becoming really a story about God, a testimony ultimately? And then again, for all of you, if you'd like to share that too, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I feel like the the testimony that I've just been kind of resonating with all all year is is how God placed everything for when Patrick's mom had a a really significant health event in August, Mm -hmm. that just, you know, 2020 being what it is, felt like a lot of God setting us up to be able to deal with that. You know, the fact that she was with us, that Patrick's sister Flo had changed her travel plans to still be with us, the fact that we were together all the time and we weren't dispersed so that when this health event happened, we could deal with it right away. And then we could, we could be at home ready to kind of monitor health follow-up stuff and Mm -hmm. for the girls to be able to be close and be comforted by, um, you know, having everybody together instead of being dispersed. And so that like all of us just keep, keep reflecting. It feels like since August on like, wow, we could not have planned this, but Mm -hmm. It's like God saved her life and prepared mm. all of us to be mm. exactly where we needed to be yeah. for like optimal recovery. And so, yeah, and even, yeah, so, so even, and we have been telling this story to each other even since August. Sometimes we'll just be sitting around in the house and say like, man, can you remember these people at the park who helped us like call 911 and make mm. sure that we were ready? Yeah. Or like, oh. do you remember the doctors and nurses in the hospital and how they like, spoke life into these different parts of this situation or like how yeah all these different things that it feels like we are just really in awe of like wow (laughs) this is exactly what we needed and even the things that we didn't think we wanted were were also felt like that was part of God setting us up for that yeah yeah I remember you telling that story about those two women who were yeah just happened to be there it was like angelic it was like they were right there to help you guys when you had your hands full with the girls and, and all that so yeah just amazing Mark, how about you? Like, what, what, when, how does your story become kind of like very much a God story, much of a testimony of what God is doing ultimately? Yeah, I mean, just from, from what I shared, when I think about all of this, like, you know, COVID happened and, you know, and, and, and then I was preparing for the sabbatical and I'm like planning to go to Kenya, you know, for like six weeks and then everything crashes, you know, and all of a sudden you can't go a- anywhere. And everyone was like, man, we're so sorry you're taking a sabbatical during this crazy time, you know, but it was crazy. How, it was interesting how God worked even through that, mm. you know, to allow me to not have to travel far away, to be able to stay here and then, you know, plan that retreat. And even just that question of who's the real mark, like that would never have come from me, mm. right? So when yeah, I yeah. look at all of that, um, being at that silent retreat, I honestly... I was freaking out because I, I don't like being alone, right, for, for a long time. And so I was like, what am I going to do during this time? And I went without a plan. I was like, okay, I'm just going to let God lead that time. And so just seeing how I was not in control of anything, but then just how God was able to 
slow me down enough to hear him and for him to ask me the right questions to reflect yeah. on getting to know who I really am. Yeah. So I'm like, man, it's just God. It's, mm. not, it's nothing that I did. And again, I also see a gift of community, in like God working through community because the, the sabbatical was a gift from this church and this community. So in so many ways, it's like God, community, and everything just working together. Mm. And I'm just like, thank you, God, for, yeah. for this... Um, yeah. It's like he gave you a better Sabbath than you had planned for yourself. Yep. Because it would have been more like human and like, yeah. oh, I'm going to go here. I'm going to do this. And yeah. It's like, no, slow down. Yep. You need to know yourself. Uh-huh. And so I think that, that, you know, that, that does sound like a God kind of more wisdom, more shaping, more yeah. forethought than what we could do ultimately. Yeah. Well, the third question, again, comes out of what we talked about is this, this is very helpful for the future. So how do the insights from this past year shape how you approach the next one, right? In Deuteronomy 8, do this so that you can live and increase. Do this so that you'll never forget the Lord. It's supposed to like shape things. And so I think the question for all of us is, what does that mean for the future? Like, what are the insights and what are the stories that we know about ourselves, but ultimately about God? How does that change what we, what we do in the future? And I think for me, like kind of rewinding to those past two questions, I, I have really felt this sense that the Bible is true. And that sounds <laughs> really weird. <laughs> But it felt like a biblical year, like this global pandemic where people are separated from each other beyond what they want. You think about the exile of Israel or about the scattering, the persecution, and you think about things of that nature, and we're like, oh, we're living through that. We're living Mm. through a pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. This is, it's a global catastrophe. And seeing that God still moved in the exile and the persecution of the church, and he still moves now, made me feel like, oh my gosh, the pulse and the movement of God is still working. Yeah. Like it's, it hasn't diminished at all. The same global events can happen and God will, will be exactly the same God. Mm-hmm. And also I've been taking a lot more seriously some of the more difficult passages. I mean, God says like, there will be many people who call him Lord, Lord, and are, uh, he'll say, I don't know you. Yeah. And yeah. this year, honestly, there have been moments where I said, oh my gosh, this is true. Hmm. There are people who, by all, by all outward manifestations, say, Lord, Lord. But there is this deep disconnect between what I see them living and ultimately uh, well, what I believe a true Christ follower should be like. And to me, it felt like the Bible coming alive, you know? Like, usually we just kind of gloss over that. Yeah. We would say, oh, no, they're a believer. It's fine. But this time, I think I'm taking a more critical view. Of, is this what Jesus is saying? He said that there will be people who say they are all out for him, but he'll say, I don't know who you are. I, I don't know what, I don't know, I, yeah. I don't recognize you. Yeah. And so to me, that, that deeper core of the Bible, you know, really blossomed. And I think for me, I realized that I want to live into that deeper core. Like I want to get beyond the superficialities of like, oh yeah, you know, we're doing this, we're doing that. That deeper eternal core still exists of God's power, God's judgment, God's mercy. And I want us to live, in, I want to kind of go, into that space more often and less into the, oh yeah, let's build this bigger, let's make this shinier. That feels less and less, I mean, it's, it's a vanishing priority for me. And it feels like God showed me this is the core, this is what church is. Yeah. It's beyond any of the trappings ultimately. Yeah. That's what I feel I'm being drawn into from this year. Yeah. I don't know about you guys, like, what, it, what does this year kind of shape or change for, for the year to come? Yeah, um, I, I, maybe just to echo something that you said, I, I was meeting with a group of really close, I, I'll call them my brothers, and one of the things that stood out for us as we're reflecting on this year is exactly what you say, that um, you know we've been separated from each other, um, there's been a lot of turmoil, division, and I, I think one thing that came out of that group was people realized, oh, my, you know, I've, I've been leaning on other people for, you know, or, or, um, to sustain my faith. But this time has just taught people that, oh, I need to have a personal relationship with Jesus mm. um, so that, you know, he's, he's not, oh, the Jesus that I worship at in the rock building with, mm. with my rock. Like, uh, you know, I have a personal relationship with him. Yeah. And so focusing more on, oh, who is Jesus to me? You know, I, it's not the Jesus that I inherited from my parents or from yeah. my pastor, um, but just having that personal relationship that personal relationship. But also going back to, um, for me, on, on that journey of getting to know myself, 
one of the things is, again, really paying attention to uh, myself. And I think one of the big things that, again, God is teaching me is um, bring my full self to the table, right? Um, so, when, when, so wherever I am, just bring your full self. Pay attention to your emotions. Be present um, fully and not uh, turn off uh, some things just because I'm like, oh, that doesn't matter. Pay attention to that. So yeah. that's one of the things that I'm trying to do as I go into the new year, paying attention to all of who I am and yeah. bringing that to the table. I mean, that makes perfect sense, yeah. right? As God yeah. teaches you that to kind of all have to pay attention to that yeah. and not just kind of let it go. And I think, again, these are all steps that have to be connected to each other. Yeah. Because what if you like know yourself and you're like, oh, yeah, that's great but you don't live any differently or it doesn't affect how you, your mindsets or mentalities. It feels like a loss or the final step of that, that puzzle is not there yeah. ultimately. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, again, I, oh, Heather, I don't know. If oh, I was just yeah. thinking just that sense of depth that you talked about, Pastor Peter, of I feel like there's so many like real things that matter that really rose mm. to the surface this year of yep. like, oh, there's no sports to watch. There's no like new movies coming out. And like, <laughs> actually there's people that are really hurting and yeah. that, pain has been there yeah. all along hmm. and yeah. to say like hey as a church as individuals as friends and community members like the places where we haven't paid attention to that or like sat in that together where we needed to like that matters and that's I feel like an invitation from God for mm. all of us to say like hey this is what community is supposed to be and this is what we're called to be as the church together yeah. mm-hmm. so I think that's my challenge for the year of like let's not let's not you know, as things gradually add back in, just mm. say like, oh, we're back to normal. Like, mm. never mind. We don't have to worry about 2020 anymore. But to say like, no, there's some real like heart issues that God taught us about that we, we need to carry forward. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think that's definitely true. One turning point for me was the idea of essential workers. Like, you know, yeah. you know think about essential workers, mm-hmm. but now it's mm-hmm. like, if someone doesn't pick food in a farm, we're not going to be in a good space. If yeah. someone doesn't deliver the mail, you know, we're not going to be in a good space. All these essential workers that I think have not been essential by any stretch of the imagination, we realize we, we can't live without them ultimately. And it'd be, a pain, it'd be a, such a shame if we, like, learn that, or we see that, and then in the coming season, it's like, oh, forget, you know, forget this. They don't need this. They don't need benefits or whatever the case might be. So I think there are so many lessons that we've learned that if we don't connect them, they'll just fall through our fingers again, yeah. you know. So yeah. um, there's so much we can learn, I think. And again, this time can't capture it for, you know, us or for any or all of us, but I hope that it begins to spark a moment of reflection, remembrance, knowing ourselves, knowing God in the midst of those stories, and then connecting to how we live so that, um, so we can bear the benefits of, of remembering together. Uh, with that, thank you guys for yeah. joining us and everyone who responded good. as well. I'm glad that we could share that time together. And I think it's really appropriate and fitting that we should partake of the communion today um, because it is um, a sacrament of remembrance. This is to remember. This is one of those moments in the Christian life that we take time to reflect, that we take time to remember God's story, what Jesus has done, and how that changes our life as well. And I encourage you, if you have um, elements, to go grab them, uh, a bread of some kind and some kind of juice or even water um, that we could remember as we are called to do. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it, saying, this is my body, which is broken for each of you. Do this, however often you eat of it, in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. He said, this is a new covenant, which is in my blood. Do this, however often you drink of it, in remembrance of me. For whenever we eat of this bread, or we drink of this cup, we are celebrating the Lord's death until he returns again. I encourage you to take a piece of your bread and to dip it in the cup, pass it around to one another, and as we do that, to spend a moment in remembrance, not just of our own stories, but in the stories of of how God has been a part of our lives, and to also to remember how this shapes us for the future. Come, let us all remember together.
I'm going to pray for us before we continue on with our service. Lord, we do confess that we are a very forward-thinking people, always thinking about what is to come and what is next, and that has been helpful in some ways, but detrimental in others, God. And in some ways, we have lost the blessings of remembrance, that many times we don't even know ourselves because we forget our own stories. We also lose the chance to see our stories as your stories, to connect the dots from what we experienced to what you have done. And then to make the final leg of that journey to think about the things that we have lived, the things that you have done, to how we should live differently, what attitudes we should have, who should we see, what should we be doing. Help us, just for a moment even, to remember, to remember all of these things so that we might be able to reap all the blessings of remembrance as the people of Israel did. We thank you for this time to remember you and your son. In Jesus' name we pray.